This is Deborah Hunter, and today is June 14th, uh, 2018, <laughs> and it's around 1 o'clock, and we're at the TCU uh, radio station in Fort Worth, and it's KTCU FM 88.7, the choice. <laughs> and I'm here with Luther Smith, and we're going to be talking about his work and a show uh, that is going to happen in September, kind of a retrospective of your work uh, over, over 45 years and uh, in conjunction with your retirement from it. A TCU. Specifically, the 35 years that I've been oh, here. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And, and the show opens on the 23rd of August and mm -hmm. closes on the 21st of September. Okay. Great. Well, I want to thank you for giving me the opportunity to become more deeply acquainted with the 45 years of careful, committed, conscientious, and creative image making. What a pleasure to trace thematic and formal interests that have sustained your engagement over a long and successful career as an artist. From this long view, we can observe how the medium of photography has transitioned from a film-based medium where silver salt prints are created in a wet darkroom to a digital capture where electronic files are outputted to inkjet printers in a computer lab. I am sure that our discussion of your motivations and work habits will situate individual series of your photographs within a larger context of your working life, but also draw parallels with larger technological and artistic developments uh, with what might, in what might be called the contemporary history of the medium of photography. But first, some simple biographical information. Born in 1950 in to Shemingo. <laughs> <laughs> a county in uh, uh, Mississippi. That's where you were born. And your website states that you hunted and fished in this kind of, in this rural environment. Yes. Uh, at the age of 10, you moved to Aurora, Illinois, which is a far western suburb, uh, but also a town that's about 40 miles uh, west of downtown Chicago. And so you went to high, grammar school and high school there. And then later on, you attended the University of Illinois in Champaign-Urbana, in which you began your photographic uh, career. Uh, after undergraduate degree, you attended Rhode Island School of Design and received your MFA with studying with Harry Callahan and Aaron Siskin. And this is where we both met 26, when we were both 26 years old. You moved back to Champaign for nine years of teaching there and then moved in 1983 to teach at TCU where you worked for 35 years. This exhibit at TCU is in honor of your work both as a faculty member and practicing artist. I'd like to group your work into two major narrative concerns, each which brings specific formal considerations for camera format, focal length choices, tonality, compositional strategies, etc. The first and early group concerns people directly. The second group, which is much larger, concerns the landscape, both built and unbuilt. Here, you are addressing the land use, environmental issues, and the nurturing nature of nature. And rivers and trees figure prominently and reoccur in these later projects. But first, let's talk about your early work in which some photographs will be represented in the uh, TCU show. These are pictures of people, really portraits, and a lot of them have an emphasis uh, uh, on women. You're done with the 35 millimeter portable camera, normal focal length lens that doesn't uh, distort. The work you did in Rhode Island uh, was done in 1975 using infrared film that makes everyone glow in a rather surrealistically beautiful way. The attractive young college women, uh, uh, mostly their faces, less of their bodies, have disinterested expressions on their faces, though you are very close. Then you move to Champaign and you photograph more high schoolers. And then finally, when you move to Fort Worth, you continue to photograph young people at high school rodeos. And so this is in 1985 to 86, you're photographing in black and white in high school rodeos. And this is some of the work, the earliest work that will appear in the show. Can you talk to us about that early work? Well, when I first got to TCU, I was, I was photographing young people and I really, uh, 
I'm, I'm still interested in this, and I'm especially interested in it in those days, that whole transition from moving from uh, childhood to adulthood. And uh, just, I mean, I, I find it really interesting. I mean, there are a lot of uh, great photographers that have done a lot of work on it. You know, there's a show at the Amy Carter right now, Rini Maytar, uh, that, has this, that really is wonderful mm-hmm. work about growing up. Uh, but it's something that's always attracted me and interested me. And the the rodeo pictures were especially interesting to me because it was like a little easy place for me to find uh, a project that I could sort of concentrate on and allow things to happen that were uh, spontaneous in many ways. And part of the things that worked so well for me was that I got to be known in this group of people very quickly, right? And they they got tired of me, you know? So they just ignored me mostly. And so I could be really close to these folks. And mostly I used a wide-angle lens, but the, some of the uh, photographs that are a little tighter are, are shot with a longer lens. But basically what I was interested in doing was, was essentially what I do now – with landscape pictures but just to sort of be able to try a bunch of things and to try to try to kind of connect with these folks on a on a sort of a at some level on a spiritual level uh young people who who participate in something like rodeo have kind of a stoic quality and uh i think i've always had a little bit of that myself Mm -hmm. and so i can connect with it and I also really liked them. I mean, I liked those kids. They were, you know, can-do kind of people. I mean, they're the kind of people that if you're in trouble, you want them with you. Well, when I was looking at them, uh, I thought how, I, I want to say how innocent they look compared to what I would imagine young people look like today. Even though some of them, were, there were boyfriend and girlfriend portraits, there was just a kind of honesty, straightforward solidity about them. But there wasn't a kind of over... Uh, glamorization in, in in the in the faces that I saw, even in the women, even if they sort of had their hair done, there was just something down to earth about them, and um, and even the spectators that you would photograph uh, uh, there too, besides the rodeo um, participants. Um, uh, is there now? I'm going to put ask you this: Is there? You say that you've been interested in this transition period, and and I can. And yes, it, I can see why, why it would be of interest. But why do you think you were interested in it? Uh, maybe, I mean, a lot of that has, you know, it's like personal psychological stuff. I mean, growing up, I think, is very difficult, uh, especially emotionally growing up. And uh, I think all of us have our own paths in that. Mm-hmm. And for me, a lot of times uh, my photographs allow me to kind of come to terms with things and uh, – and I think, you know, photographing high school in Champaign allowed me to sort of remember the better times that I had in high school and not just uh, the anxiety and all of those other things that go with it, which all children have, I think, in terms of growing up. And uh, photographing the rodeo kids was, was just like a – it was also a kind of connection with Fort Worth, Texas. Mm-hmm. And Fort Worth, Texas – in 1984 and five and six. Yeah. yeah. It, yes, it doesn't kind of surprise me that you coming here would want to start sort of seeing what your what this new world was like, bringing with you some of the some of your previous concerns, and that this just like you said, it'd be a great place to uh, a little uh, laboratory in which you could walk around. And I and I might mention that there were some stunningly beautiful sort of overviews of the, those rodeos where the landscape uh, or the, the faraway shot comes in, and those are really beautiful. Um, now, this is going to sound a little weird, but um, so many of your pictures uh, in which there's a, kind of a direct connection, even if there's not eye contact, are of young women. When they were attractive college women, and then in this high school, and yet, uh, when I might be looking through feminist eyes right now, I wouldn't say they were examples of objectification or over-sexualizing all of these women. And yet it's a reoccurring theme. And even in your most recent group of pictures done in 
Paris, there are some photographs of women that reminded me of this early ones. There's some kind of wonderful thing happening in them. But I wondered, in all of this kind of, in all the years that we've been working and, and, and feminism has caused a revision and caused us to um, think about it, our, what in the classroom, what is permissible to photograph, do you have any, any thoughts or opinions about that? Just hold on a sec. Let me turn that. I think if you go into settings, I think it's off now, permanent. Okay, okay good. Mm -hmm. All right, let me. Good. It, it, well, I, I grew up, when, you know, those first ten, year, 10 years of my life, which are, you know, that sets, you're almost set in stone when, you, you know, when you have 10 years of a certain kind of life. And uh, it was a very rural area. My grandmother my mother and my two sisters were there. My father was mostly gone off working. So, you know, I grew up in what I would call a house full of women. And uh, so I, you know, I have my opinions about, uh, these are opinions, not my photography. Mm -hmm. My opinions about uh, feminism basically haven't changed since I first thought about it. And, you know, I may have an oversimplified version of what feminism is, but basically to me, uh, my, both of my sisters were uh, in many ways smarter than I was, more talented than I was, and yet they had a lot fewer opportunities in terms of making money, et cetera, and choices in their lives. And I was very aware of that. Uh, but at the same time, you know, uh, I... I even though I don't see my sisters very much these days, I felt very close to them. And I've always felt a closeness to women in general. Uh, and, you know, physical beauty is physical beauty. It doesn't have to be a negative uh, kind of, you know, I'm going to use this for some something for myself. It can just be an admiration like the way that I admire a tree or, or light coming through, uh, you know, through space, you know. Well, that's a wonderful thing you just said because I've been looking for a kind of a, a way to unite this kind of a, 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 a attraction or uh, that you've had for women, both in photographs, but also in just personally observing you and talking to you and knowing, looking at you and having fun with you. And then these pictures of the landscape. And you just made a connection by talking about admiration and a kind of admiration for... Um, well, I'm not sure what, what, what would you say beauty? Would you say integrity? What what words? Well, I, beauty is maybe a, a it may be some a little too superficial, but you know, I mean, I I recently saw like a little post where somebody had listed all of the possible adjectives that you could use toward a woman that weren't cute or mm -hmm. pretty mm -hmm. or and even though I can't think of them at this <laughs> moment, I I you know. I think that that it's that list that really is, you know, I mean, I think of women in some ways, I mean, it's not that I don't like men, I do like men, <laughs> uh, but it's, I mean, it's easier for me to talk to some men, but it's, it's a lot easier for me to sort of understand what's happening with, with women and to be able to kind of connect with them on an emotional basis quickly. Well, now that we can segue into the land, and actually, I think it's a wonderful thing that you, uh, I wouldn't say you abandon your earlier concerns, but they kind of morphed or resituated themselves um, onto the land in, in, in a way. And you went from being kind of a social person, a social animal, w photographing in crowded or uh, populated situations, to photographing by yourself walking in, uh, as we'll talk about, de we'll define in a minute, not the great ca Grand Canyons, but all of these sort of more modest environments and where there is evidence of man, but it's always uh, underplayed, whether it be the buildings in the background or some, in most, most cases, not all, but in most cases, they really emphasize uh, than what we would call nature, sort of untamed or unmanicured nature. 
Um, so you may so can, look talk about that transition from and 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 the work that I I know was the was I think you went from the rodeo to the river and you did this book that is a wonderful book on the Trinity River um, and uh, and that was done in 1986 to 1996 and the book was published in uh, 1997 and it's um, a wonderful book in which the well you tell tell us about the this this project well the uh when i finished with the high school rodeo i didn't really want to sort of go sideways and do another project that was like that i wanted to do something that was that was new and and also was challenging technically so even though i had used a view camera a lot and i had taught view camera the whole time that i'd been uh been teaching photography i i uh I hadn't really done a, an elaborate project with it. And uh, I, one of the things that I noticed as soon as I moved to Texas was that there was a lot more opportunity for me to be outside a lot more during the year. And, you know, this, the summertime's a little difficult because it gets so hot, but fall, spring, and winter were like, you know, it was easy to be outside. And uh, so, I mean, part of that was just, being attracted to that. So I bought an 8x10 camera. Uh, I started making pictures with it. I, uh, I met uh, Bird Williams, who, uh, who you know, was interested in antique cameras. And he told me about uh, banquet cameras and, and which ones were better. And uh, I found one and bought one and uh, kind of refinished it and, and put new bellows on it and all those kinds of things. And then started photographing with this panorama camera as well. So these were big negatives, and uh, just the process itself required a whole lot of uh, technique that I didn't have yet, and I had to learn it. And so that was all interesting to do. But a lot of it had to do with just, you know, I was in a new place, and I, I somehow I wanted to connect with it. And, you know, it started out with me going out and photographing with my car that didn't have air conditioning, so I had to fit into the landscape. And, uh, and that kind of fitting in where you, you, you know, you have to take breaks, you have to park in the shade, and, uh, you know, you spend time, like, resting more than moving. Uh, all of those things kind of created a a mental state that allowed me to make some pictures. The, the book itself kind of came out of a, of a, a, a project where I, I said, how am I going to put these pictures together so that, that there's not just one photograph that's interesting, but a bunch of photographs that fit together. And, and in many ways, I would rather just walk around or drive around and make pictures and then the best ones I want to show and the others I don't. But, you know, if you do that, you don't end up with books. You end up with a bunch of photographs that kind of are connected but not aren't really connected. And uh, my friend Tom Southall said to me, uh, you know, you, if you want any attention from this work, you need to finish it. And, uh, and so... You know, that's what I did. I essentially, you know, set out a plan. I photographed from the very tops of the river, you know, all of all of, out of the, the fingers out on the edges of the river, the West Fork and the East Fork and the Clear Fork and the Elm Fork, and then photographed it basically all the way down until it goes into the to uh, Trinity Bay. And and then from that, I selected a group of pictures and it became that book. But you know, there's there there's also a lot of interesting issues around water that are worth thinking about and talking about for a person who's interested in ideas as well as pictures. And uh, and the river's a real good way to talk about a lot of those things because all of the environmental issues are right there. I mean, you know, the the lack of care that we have for the space around us. You know, I mean, there's just a lot of interesting things. And most of those are, are in the part of the book where it describes the pictures and then discusses the individual pictures. Yeah. 
Yes, I thought it was a wonderful book, and I thought the the back, uh, not the where you tell us where each picture was made, and then you've got uh, John Nichols uh, giving uh, an overview, sort of of the of the more geographical aspects of it, and then Tom Southall, I thought, who did a wonderful job, and he some of the quotes that he has from that book about you are applicable today. You know, I really appreciated that. Um, Let's talk a little bit about rivers. So in Aurora, I went and looked up Aurora. There's the Fox River. My first view camera picture was made of the Fox River. And what about in Mississippi, the Tennessee River and all the tributaries are around there? So do you have some experience? You said fishing. I mean, do you have some childhood memories of waterways? Uh, You know, with rural people, I mean, they always try to figure out ways to have fun, usually without money. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, one of them's fishing, right? And uh, so, you know, there were always, and near us were some what we call creeks, but they really were more like the Trinity River in terms of size. Mm-hmm. And uh, so there was always fishing, you know, my mother and her sisters, you know. So we spent a lot of time doing those kinds of things as a, as a way to, to not be working. You know? Farm people work a lot. Well, I'm I'm not I'm listening to you, and I'm 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 just thinking about uh, connecting this again. Just thinking about the rivers of your childhood, and then of all the geographical features or all of the landscape that's available to you in North in North Texas, you chose. Of course, it's prominent the way that the Trinity ribs runs right through Fort Worth. But I mean, it doesn't surprise me. In fact, it delights me that you would make some kind of special connection that it, that is not just intellectual but all, but has a you know deeper resonance um for you well you know i mean that part of part of all of this for me is a little bit like what happened this morning when i was playing with my dogs i get up real early right and uh you know one of them runs around and the other one i throw the ball and she chases it and we kind of make a little circle around wherever we are but at the end, the one who's catching the ball gets a little tired, and she usually finds whatever shade's available. Mm-hmm. So there's a kind of a special place to me, like along a, a water space, under a tree, that just kind of is my kind of place. And so it's real easy for me to want to make a picture of that. Very interesting. And it's, in, it's lovely to look at those pictures uh, and now to bring that sensibility to it because I anyway the sense it's already there you stop and you're looking at a kind of a throwaway place you know I mean sometimes uh, you know in fact all so much of that book is you really have to look carefully to think what is you know what's so significant about this place when you're doing a portrait of a person we know that you're paying attention to an individual so I think when you move toward this landscape you're really defining your subject matter in a newer way and for yourself and finding you know, different, uh, uh, making portraits of the places, but places that people would not normally think are significant enough to to think about. So. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure that this has happened to you as well. You know, you're photographing something and someone comes up and they're looking, trying to figure out what you're oh, photographing. Yeah. They're wondering where the bird or the squirrel is. <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's really funny. It's such a big camera, too. So then what happened after you sort of finished that project and it went to press? That's in, in, in 97. Then you have, uh, it seems to me, Several projects going on at the same time. Can you talk? Um, one of them is the South, and the other one is where where I live. Uh, are those both contemporaneous projects? Uh, or? They they are. Yeah. And the the problem with photographing someplace at you know as big as the South is that there's a lot of traveling involved, and and there, that's a difficult thing in many ways to sort of solve. And I think. Even though I like a lot of the pictures that I made of the South, it seems much more unresolved than any of mm. the other projects. And and I think because it you know it, it's over a long period of time, multiple cameras. Uh, I mean, I like a lot of the pictures, and I think people who see the show will as well. Uh, but it seems like unresolved as a project. And uh, but I the the where I live stuff. 
I mean, I was able to do it anytime I had some time and the light was right. You know, I mean, because basically we're talking about photographing within, you know, just a few miles of my house. So, you know, the Trinity River stuff started by photographing real near my house. And uh, and the same thing, you know, with this this other uh, group of work that's uh, about where I live, essentially. And and now the, the latest work is really just a continuation of that, but with, with different materials. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little more about where I live. So describe the spaces that you are photographing. And then we'll talk about the technical aspects of them. The okay. Color right. and, and introduction of color and stuff. But where are these places? Well, a lot of those pictures are, are made in a neighborhood. Like I, when I first moved to Fort Worth, I, I, I moved into an inner city neighborhood. And... Uh, and I was excited about that, and and you know, so we rehabbed the house and did all this other stuff, and we and I uh, was able to get to pretty much anything in Fort Worth very quickly because I was in the middle of the city. Uh, eventually, in 2000, we moved to a suburban neighborhood, still in the city of Fort Worth, but pretty far out. But that neighborhood was being built, and uh, so a lot of those where I live photographs were made before that, but the most effective ones, I think, were made after that, where I was photographing those neighborhoods that weren't neighborhoods yet. Sometimes it was a stock tank or, you know, the edge of a road that really was pretty rural still, but pretty soon would have a bunch of houses in it. Uh, and even though it's not really apparent from some of the pictures, like the, the high school rodeo arena, like one of the photographs, uh -huh. There's a neighborhood that occupies that space that is my neighborhood, where I live now, which is kind of bizarre. Because, you know, it's like the difference between 1983 and, and 2003, you know. Well, I'm going to uh, say that you are, um, what I, I'm not begging the question, but when you say neighborhoods, or the way you do, which the way you simply des describe them now makes me think of new topographics and the California subdivisions and a neighborhood corner or an overview of a cul-de-sac. But that's not what most of your pictures are of. It's true, but but I am influenced by that, and I'm influenced by uh, by uh, some of the writing of John Sarkowski about landscape. I mean, one of the things that he mentioned in the book that he did about landscape, specifically landscape was uh, was the idea that that as Americans we often uh, look for uh, these exotic places like Yosemite or something like that so that we can kind of do this little praising thing. So it's like going to church, you know, and saying a prayer over it. Uh, and then that way we can ignore the landscape that's out in our front yard or down the road. We can just throw a trash into it and stuff. But it's not, you're not photographing front yards. You're photographing what I would say are the interstitial spaces, those fringe areas between where the, I mean, the one, the ones that this is what I recognize, how I describe them, is in the background of secondary importance and yet place sort of like a looming eye are those rooftops of the suburban, those, those uniform rooftops of the suburban. Um, homogeny that most of us in the art world have come to see as evil and they're back there and then there's this kind of lush foreground area of forgotten spaces sometimes there's a creek there's forgotten uh, clumps of bushes of trees sometimes flowering beautifully these you know and not just not wildflowers that we would expect in Texas but to see other kinds of trees just blossoming or catching the fall light in a certain way and it's like a moment of exhilaration of beauty among I don't want to say squalor because we don't think of we think of squalor as inner cities not the suburbs but it's like uh, a um, renew a renewal from from uh, the 
whatever the the kingdom over there, the 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 way we all live in these uniform places, especially in Texas. But all of this, these you know, I, the, cultural geographers have have a term for these spaces that are between subdivisions that are not developed. There may be some of them you may didn't photograph them. They may have culverts to divert water, or they may still have an original creek right there. But there. And the thing that I love about these pictures, um, uh, it, well, let's talk about color, and then I'll uh, return to some compositional devices. But all of a sudden, you're in color. You're shaking your head yes. So tell us why color. Well, I mean, you know, it's it's a little bit like the the moving to the view camera thing, right? I mean, part of the reason that that folks like me are interested in photography is because of of like the learning process. You know, and like I, I, I started uh, in college as a as an engineering student, and so, you know, I'm one of those people who kind of likes to make things and fix things and solve problems and things like that. And so, adding like a new, uh, not it doesn't have to be new physically, but a new piece of equipment to it changes the way that I think about it, or changing from black and white to color, right? It, it forces me to have to learn some things that I wanted to learn. But I've always liked color, and uh, and I wanted to make some color pictures. And so the the thing is about color is that it, it uh, especially is kind of magical when you have both interesting light and interesting light that has interesting color, mm -hmm. right? Because, you know, light is really important in black and white, but... Uh, and it defines the picture in many ways, but in color, it adds it adds an, uh, this other dimension to it that has nothing to do with texture and form. It has to do with something really kind of magical, and I was very interested in that. And and I f I feel like those pic I couldn't have made those pictures without them being in color. Uh, 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 yes, but I think you used color both extravagantly and yet in a restrained way that sounds contradictory because you could have photographed those landscapes with in sunset or early morning on those special days when you would get in I, I know you were photographing in those time of days but there are like spectacular light shows that can go on occasionally in the sky and you have sort of descriptive you know the light is beautiful and luxurious but it's not overly over the top uh and uh it, it and I think you're, that, that even though you've talked about transitioning to color uh, because it provides new challenges, but I think it offered you an opportunity to speak of beauty, of finding beauty, of appreciating beauty. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and it's this dance of color that is so spectacular in these photographs. Uh, I love the uh, the compositional, you have a reoccurring compositional device where you have something in the foreground that goes kind of straight up or you've got some boughs or something coming down and it creates a kind of, of implied plane that's transparent, a kind of filigree or tapestry in which uh, leaves and twigs and, and branches and uh, are errant and following sort of almost, they're almost chaotic, but the way you've organized them, they're just a really beautiful f a flatness, almost like a, uh, a Jackson Pollock painting in which there are poured ex lines moving in all different directions. But then behind these open the spaces between these uh, foliage, you can see a, a, a medium ground, a space, and then you see the houses in the background. And most of the time, your sky is very small in the pictures. And when you do, you the typical landscape photograph would always have the sky at some amount of top of the picture. But you've eliminated the sky, or at least minimized it, by having this kind of grid go over it. But I think that they're so beautiful that and that that grid has a um, uh, that plane has a way of enveloping the viewer to sort of feel that space, not a claustrophobic space, but one that kind of is surrounding one and defining this space that is different from the hinterland over there. Um, does that make sense to you? Well, I. It, this makes me remind it reminds me of why I uh, was glad that you were going to do this. <laughs> but uh, the I think that 
the for me a lot of the you know you mentioned you know uh, in the art world you know the the suburbs are thought of as this well see that's 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 the thing that's that's most important to me is that I really uh, I don't think of it in those terms uh, I mean there was a time when I moved to the inner city that I didn't want to live in the suburbs uh, and you know I had a lot of reasons for it but I didn't hate people that lived in the suburbs. <laughs> <laughs> I I like them just fine, and uh, I uh, when I when I'm out photographing there, I I just return to being a child. I mean, it's as simple as that. I mean, it's it's just like being a kid out playing, and you you know you find these places that are really cool places to be, and to look at stuff. And I mean, that's literally what I'm doing. I mean, I'm just out there walking around. Looking at things and going, oh man, this is so cool. And and part of what's cool about it isn't just being there; it's about being able to make this picture that's really special. And not all of them are special. I mean, I make a lot of unspecial picture, but in order to make special pictures, I have to make a lot of pictures. My uh, hit rate is so much higher now than it used to be when I was using those view cameras. Because just the process took so long. It just, I mean, it wasn't that I didn't make any good pictures. I made lots of good pictures. But it's, you know, I could go out and make, I don't know, 50 pictures in one morning or, or easily. And there's probably two or three of those that are going to be pretty nice. And uh, when I was making view camera pictures, I might make two or three pictures. And there might be one of them that's nice. But it'll probably be one out of a four or five day shooting period rather than one or two every day so that's really been you know moving from from film and view cameras to uh to digital cameras has really really helped my photography i think well was was i'm under the impression that in the very beginning you were using the view camera with film in color of these of spaces, oh, yeah. and then you switch to digital capture. Yeah. Can you talk? And 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 then you had also mentioned to me that this ability right, right now to, to take a lot of pictures. So how talk about this transition from the dig, the digital camera and and besides the number what or or about you're saying that the number that you needed to take that many pictures and i uh, i'm listening to you but there must be something that you like about taking a lot of pictures oh yeah 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 i i mean it's it's that whole it's that whole thing about just kind of finding a way to 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 essentially do what my friend art since boy used to say he was he was my uh, photo teacher and then I eventually worked with him at Illinois and one of the things he used to say is you know you just want to get to the point where you just just like that kid sticking his finger in the puddle going what's this going to feel like and so a lot of the pictures that I make are really about not knowing that this is going to be great that you know if I do this it's going to be great but but thinking what if I try this and let me try this and see what I can do with this. And there's there's some kind of deep belief that a bunch of these pictures are going to be interesting enough that I'm going to want to look at them and I'm going to want to spend the time that it takes to print them and edit them and all of those things. And I really loved working with the view camera. And I loved working with view camera in color. Uh, I didn't know that there were problems for me with it. I really didn't. I mean... I didn't realize how difficult it was to translate film into digital and how inaccurate uh, the, the film was in terms of actually seeing the color that's in the space. But I still managed to make a bunch of pictures that I really liked. But, you know, as soon as you, you get a really good digital camera and you make some pictures with that and you realize the, the almost unlimited possibilities in terms of color it's it's like oh my god i can't believe it's this good you know so one time we had a conversation between uh, in which i asked you to look at some of my prints and i was trying to reference them to be sort of realistic and you said something like there's no such thing as realistic color you know just 
there isn't. And I remember that was shocking to me. But your own work and your own post-production work or your own uh, use of uh, HD, uh, high definition, uh, high, uh, high dynamic range, which is a s software in the camera and in, in printing, uh, in, in that transforms the colors from to, to less realistic, on a range of sort of more realistic to less realistic. You've deviated by working with a very saturated images and the shadows being more open, the tonal range. So talk a little bit about the f freedom that you have given yourself to print these images in a kind of hy hyper, hyper, hyper way. Well, I think part of it, you know, is, is uh, when I started when I started printing uh, digitally, which was just a great thing mm -hmm. because, you know, you didn't have to have a, a tray size. You weren't stuck with tray sizes. You know, it, all the, the prints had to go through trays and whatever size tray you owned or sinks were big enough is all you could print to. Uh, when, I went, when I left, when I moved from that to digital printing, which was as big as your machine mm -hmm. was, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I was just, I was amazed about that just a scale thing that you could do, but one of the things that happened was when I started showing those photographs, people started asking me things which was really made me uncomfortable. Which was, like, are these photoshopped? Right? They would say things like, "Are these photoshopped?" And I always was uncomfortable with that. And at first, I didn't know how to answer it because, you know, yeah. if you make a photograph and and you print it in the dark room with an enlarger. Nobody asks you if it's Photoshop, but we burn and dodge and we change contrast and we do all kinds of things that are manipulations mm -hmm. of the picture. And then and the black and whiteness of it is an, an incredible manipulation, mm -hmm. right? And if you, if you have a film that's more blue sensitive, it's very different than film that's more red sensitive, mm -hmm. right? But most people just don't know that. And so what's happened is that a lot of people are based their idea of what reality is on a history of photography, not what the world looks like. Because I'm not convinced that we all see the world in the same yeah. way. And uh, so, I mean, now what, what I do to sort of justify everything that I do is I think, okay, so black and white doesn't look like the world either, okay? So if black and white does, doesn't look like the world, why do I have to make pictures that look like other people think the world looks? Why shouldn't I just make pictures the way I want to make them? And, you know, sometimes I don't know how I want to make mm -hmm. them until I make them. And uh, I, th I, I like that sort of, like, discovery. And I think the first time that I did something that was a little bit outrageous using uh, HDR software, mm -hmm. I looked at it, and I went and got my wife and I brought her into the room and I said, can you believe this? And she said, man, that's really over the top or something like that. And, and I kept thinking, boy, I like this. <laughs> this is so interesting. Because it was, you know, it didn't look, there used to be uh, like these process looking images mm -hmm. when digital first started to, to exist. And it was a little bit like using process colors rather than trying to get a full color tonal range just to, as those colors. And I never wanted that, but I, but I do like the idea of sort of having color that is a surprise, you know? And all of the colors are there. They're just hyped up, you know? There's this hyper, uh, you know, so if, if like few, on a day where there's uh, sun in the sky and there's, there's shade, usually the shade is much more blue than the, the other light that's there, but you don't notice it because your mind corrects for it but it's there and i mean you could use a color meter and measure it if you wanted to you know and see that it's really true but i've been sort of accentuating that all of those things that are there i'm, I'm just making myself more aware of them and i bet and i'm i i mean i have a lot of fun making those pictures because they're all discoveries in many ways that's interesting um uh, to return a little bit to the the narrative quality of these pictures and where where I live, what do you want people, what do you think people, when they look at these, 
of these spaces that, and I mean, how do you think people respond or how, and, and how would you like them to respond? Well, I'm not sure how they respond, but, but I, how I would like them to respond uh -huh. is essentially the way I do, which is, you know, if you look at the world as an interesting place, it is. It's as simple as that, you know, and the people who stop being interested in the world die. And I don't want to die. I want to be alive. And, I, and a lot of my photography is about, you know, verifying life and being excited about life. And, but not being Pollyannic about it. You know, I don't want to be a Pollyanna. I, I, want to be, I want to be somebody who can look the devil in the eye and not blink and still find something there. And, you know, so, I mean, the fire pictures for me were pictures that really, really kind of uh, sang because they were about tragedy, and yet there was some kind of physical beauty there that was really, really interesting, I think. You know? Tell us more about where these pictures were taken, the fire pictures. Well, you know, they, you know, if you live someplace like this, and I'm sure California as well, uh, you know, where there are these wildfires, uh, it's it's hard not to end up wanting to make some pictures of them. And so, you know, the ones that I made have been somewhat convenient. You know, they've been, you know, they've, they've happened and, you know, I was able to have the next day off and, you know, go out to where they were happening and stuff. And I don't know, there's just, there's this kind of beauty that happens in tragedy in some ways, you know, it's not like I like tragedy, I don't like people dying or, you know, car wrecks or anything like that, but there's something about sort of natural disasters that are really attractive, and especially fires, and part of it's just, as a photographer, the tonal range, you know, the kind of colors that are available, you know, like really hot fires turn everything to this sort of like sort of cyan ash, you know, it's just very strange color. And then of course there's always that black that's there. That's one of the deepest blacks that you can see, you know? So, I don't know. So of your, uh, 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 of your show, you're going to include some of the fire photographs and yet you're, fo you're you, at least on your website, those, fo you don't have do you, I mean, there's, there's a lesser number of those. There aren't many. And yet they're important to you. Yeah, oh, there are not many of them, mm -hmm. no. And, uh, you know, I don't want to be, uh, I don't want to be an ambulance chaser, per se, mm -hmm. you know, who's basically just looking for tragedy to photograph. I'm just fine with dealing with it mm -hmm. when it's there, you know. But I don't want to. I don't want to be a guy who flies to California to take yeah. pictures of, right. of tragedies. Right. You know? So, how do you situate your work within the environmental movement? And you know, there's so much photography, either with text that's been added or uh, to give some sort of more specific information that the photograph can't give. Do you? Uh, who are your? Who are your peeps when you think about uh, uh, a landscape? Well, I mean, or an environment. If, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I like all of those to new topographics photographers a lot, and people who have have followed in their footsteps. Uh, uh, but in terms of the environmental movement, it's not. Uh, in terms of my photography, I, I'm not very excited about the idea of trying to use photography to convince people that my ideas are great ideas. You know, I think. You know, I I'm not. I'm not that excited about that, and I, and I don't I don't want to I I don't I think you got to be kind of dumb to be like uh, on and off about this stuff, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, and most of the people that I know that really are environmentalists, mm -hmm. I don't mean uh, academics who aren't involved mm -hmm. in environmentalism but have opinions about it. I don't mean that, or anybody else like that. I'm talking about people who really are nuts and bolts environmentalist people, you know, people who restore streams, people who, you know, study it. Almost all of them have a much more measured idea about these things. Like, these are some of the things that we could start doing right now. We could start building buildings that were like this. We could do these things, you know. And uh, I'm, I, I feel much more comfortable with those kind of people than I do people who are, are uh, absolute in either direction. And uh, so I don't really, I don't think of my pictures as being about environment. 
uh, or being environmental. I think of them as being about the world that I live in, my personal world. And that's all my photography has ever been about. You know, when I first started photographing, I photographed my nieces and nephews and my friends and, you know, and went from there. And all of my pictures have been about that, about the stuff that's close to me, the things that matter to me. And, uh, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to make a difference, you know, uh, but I don't think I can with photography. But I don't think you can be a landscape photographer and not care about the environment. I mean, thank God of the Environmental Protection Agency because if it didn't exist, my neighborhood and those little creeks wouldn't be there. Instead of those creeks being there, there would be a cement ditch where that water was moved away quickly so it wouldn't flood the neighborhood. And houses would be built closer to it because it property is really valuable. All you have to go to is North Richland Hills or Hearst, one of those cities that were built 50 years before or 60 years before, and look at some of the streams in those areas, and they're all cement ditches. And there are not birds there. I mean, they're coyotes because they come up and down through there, but there are not many birds, no trees, you know. And it's... And so when we see your photographs, if we're open to them, we feel a sense of gratitude that this beauty exists as almost just for you when you're walking by this gift that's been given to you because you recognize it uh, in uh, a kind of commonplace world. Uh, and, and so I think of them as very poetic and um, lyrical and affirmative. That's what I hope. Yeah. Thank you. Mm. Uh, you moving uh, uh, on to um, a little bit about your most your later work. It looks to me on your website that you travel to Canada and you've done and then you just have done a, quite a bit of traveling to. Uh, Europe, and so you're going to have something in the show that reflects your recent uh, uh, trip to France. Yeah, I'm going to put some pictures in there uh, of Paris, mm -hmm. and uh, part of it is that I want I want some uh, some really recent pictures in the, in the show. Uh -huh. But also, I I was I was looking at it, but I thought, God, these pictures are really great, <laughs> you know, and. Uh, because I thought they were great, I thought, you know, I better, I better show them to somebody else. And so, of course, I showed them to my wife, and she thought they were great, too. And, you know, she's much more critical than most people are. And, uh, but that wasn't enough for me. I thought, I better, I better show them to someone else. And uh -huh. so I showed them to my gallery guy, and, uh -huh. and he said, well, could you make some of these? Could you bring some of these to me? And then I realized that they probably would it would be attractive to some other people, people as well. Uh -huh. And you know, I mean, they're not travel pictures; uh -huh. they're something else. And uh, you know, they're my pictures made in Paris, as opposed to you know going to Paris and photographing Paris. They are photographs of Paris, but they're my pictures made. In well, Paris. you know, let's see. I don't know if I can phrase this the right way, but when I looked at them, and I thought, oh, you know, in some ways, I thought, oh, these are sort of travel pictures. He's, you know, gone. And then when I saw the trees, the predominance of trees in the pictures operating, you know, you have that one picture where you've got the great old buildings in the background, but you've got, I think, four little trees in a little plaza <laughs> that are just, you know, and if you just look at the picture, you think, oh, it's just of the space. But I see the trees, and I see. The and then that gets reaffirmed in a lot of in a number of other pictures where you just have the trees again a kind of a filigree against the background of these buildings that we normally think are the important things so it made me think i had just been reading um uh, about this uh, uh, meditation um teacher his last name is is well known i think it's uh kabin zin or K-A-B-A-T-Zin, and he wrote a book that was quite well known called Wherever You Go, There You Are. So I was trying to make a cute little thing like, wherever Luther goes, there's a tree. And I, and so that, it, 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 but I meant it in a deep way that this tree is, is, is a, it's a literal thing that has traveled with you. I mean, it's your, you say they're your pictures. I'm going to say that's your tree, even though it's different trees, wherever there's, and that tree represents to me a kind of constant and a symbol of 
of something that's constant and beautiful and they're human and then it made me think about the size the kind of trees that you are attracted to they're not big pine trees they're not prickly trees they're usually kind of have a human scale where you could sort of stand underneath one and maybe touch the top branches or feel the shade of them um, but uh, uh, are you aware when you're photographing are you aware that that that's a tree or are you thinking if it's a shape or what's your you know relation did you see all the trees in the pictures in Paris I, I did see the trees but the uh, and just a little bit of a side here mm -hmm. when you know in, in Mississippi it rains a lot right so the trees are much taller than they are here in fact much taller than they are even in East Texas and uh you know, so I also lived in Illinois where where it's there aren't many trees, right? It's a prairie landscape. And so all of those things have affected me. And I, I'm, I'm comfortable in open spaces. I, it's not that I'm not. Uh, I am. I'm not a, you know, it doesn't, I don't start to cry in anything when, I'm, <laughs> when, I, when the there aren't any trees. But at the same time, uh, you know, there's some kind of magic in trees. And, uh and I've always been attracted to them. I don't know why. Uh, you know, there's some kind of comfort in them. Uh, I mean, Paris for me was just a gorgeous, gorgeous place anyway. And, and uh, you know, it's it's a much op more open space than the cities, most cities that are that old. And, and it's because mm -hmm. they redid the city, right? Husband came in and, and mm -hmm. uh, redid the city. And that's why the, the boulevards are so much bigger and than a lot of other places that are that old. But, you know, they have they have some some kind of uh, the city itself cares about trees. I mean you can tell by the way that they plant them and how they you know, they're thinking about all of this stuff as 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 art. I mean they're thinking of it as art without any picture being taken of it. You know, that it's that it's affecting people's psychological being by be, having those trees in those spaces and and making the human spaces so pleasant, I mean clearly, they you know they care about the comfort of the people walking around their city, you know and and I, I think, you know that that that's what attracts me to places like that and what attracts me to the photographs that I made there. But you know I loved photographing there and it wasn't just about being in Paris; it was just about making pictures, you know. It's fun. Well, you know, for the the medium has changed. Besides, uh, uh, photo, besides the transition to digital, which we we've we've talked a little bit about it. But but I remember our teachers, Harry Callahan and even Aaron Siskin, they would go to a place and wander around. Harry did that every day, and you know, I think about. Uh, uh, the joy of wandering and and exploring, and now so much of art uh, uh, is you know you have your idea and you go out and illustrate it, uh, and everything has to fit kind of clearly into a kind of argument that you that people are putting forward, and so I, I really appreciate the kind of delight that can come through through looking at a body of work over the years, and especially these last ones where there's uh, an appreciation for just the beauty of, of our, you know, of, of our existence wherever it might be, whether it be in a, 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 a more natural place or even in a city. So it's great to make the uh, uh, connections between the work. Well, you know, I think there's, you know, right now there's a kind of a, a popularity of, uh, of sort of idea, idea first. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I mean, if you think about it in terms of literature and stuff, I mean, there, there are plenty of writers who, who are, you know, they're, I, they're idea people. I don't read mm -hmm. them very much. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, the visceral people are the ones that I'm much more interested in, you know, the stuff that's about emotion and... You know, I'm a I'm a feeling kind of person. It doesn't mean that I can't think or I can't talk, but you know, I mean that's just been my world. Mm -hmm. That's where I come from and what I'm interested in. And and I think you know the people who like those other kinds of things really like them. You know, and there's an audience for it. Uh, I'm not much of that audience. I mean, I usually go to those shows and I find things that I like there, but I seldom like the whole show. Mm -hmm. You know, or the whole idea, 
because I don't need to be convinced of some idea. I'm, you know. Is there anything uh, else that uh, you would like to talk to us about or tell us about your, uh, or any, any, anything else you would like to ask Luther that I can translate? What are the, what are the, like your parting advice for photography students at TCU? Like what, what do you hope is like a, a legacy that you've passed on um, for, for generations of students that have studied photography at TCU? Well, I mean, I, that's a, I think that's a really good question. You know, what, and, and, and just to repeat the question, it's like, what, you know, what's, what's the legacy or what, it, what are uh, the ideas that I think, I hope that students get? And for me, it's really been something that I really, I learned from my teachers more than anything else. And it's not like it was my idea. Uh, and, and I think at, at TCU in, in painting and sculpture and printmaking and ceramics, uh, in all of the other areas as well that that I did this and they did it as well, which was was to try to sort of pull from the students what it was that they had. Sometimes they didn't know what it was. Sometimes they didn't know that they were interested in ideas or visceral things or, you know, what they were interested in. But to really encourage them to be who they were and to, you know, not to make pictures like me or, you know, like somebody else, but to find somebody that they did like their pictures and then maybe try to emulate those so that and then within that to find themselves. And I, I'm. I truly believe that that artists have to find their own way. And Sinsaba, who was one of my teachers and I and and a, and a person that I taught with later on, Art Sinsaba, he used to say, "If you've got a tight guy, don't try to make him loose, right? You know, if you have somebody who's really kind of anal, uh, don't don't try to make him a loosey goosey person. Tell him that tight is good, and that he needs to make tight." really relevant to people to make those pictures that he that can get across to other people that are his way of seeing the world his way of feeling in the world and i mean that's what i try to do with my work and that's what i'd like my students to do you know is there anything else you'd like to tell us uh luther you know only that uh my time at tcu has been really special it's been a lot of fun that's great. That's great. Well, I've enjoyed this so much, and I'm so looking forward to seeing the show. And uh, it's I'm very excited to uh, visit with you about your work, which is really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you.